a great pleasure that um, I have been invited to, to speak to you today uh, about so, some of my work on uh, ethnic minority communities uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, but before kicking off, um, I'm going to introduce uh, myself uh, and also how our newly launched research institute, uh, the Lincoln International Institute for Rural Health. And so about myself, I, I'm a health demographer by, by background from France. So now you understand where my, my accent comes from. And I've been chosen to, I've chosen to, to share with you the, this picture because I believe they are a good representation of who I am and what, what my research interests are. And so you, you can see on the top left picture, the, the bigger one, uh, you can see that uh, a part of our research team with some of our close collaborators from the African Health Research Institute uh, in South Africa and the Emory University, the Cincinnati University and also Washington University in the US. And I, I really enjoy our high diversity in terms of culture and background and I'm a bit nostalgic because, you know, that, that picture, uh, it was taken uh, on February 2020, just before the, the COVID-19 pandemic, when uh, international travel uh, was much easier than now, uh, and where also close contact were, were allowed. And so the, the three right pictures were taken in West Africa. So it's a region uh, that I love and where I start my uh, career in public health research. And I'm particularly interested by infectious diseases and the new technology. For example, in that region, we were the first to conduct uh, fund-based surveys at national scale. And we were also one of the first teams to investigate the, the use and the feasibility of blood sample transportation using uh, untrue drone in West Africa, as you can see on the bottom uh, picture we, with, a, with a cat. And um, you, you can even see that even local animals were quite intrigued uh, by, by the drones, uh, but I guarantee no animals were harmed during the study and we didn't try to transport anything more than human blood sample. And in addition to my academic position, I, I'm also uh, deeply involved involved in, in various NGO and community-based organization, as you, you can see on the bottom uh, left picture, where I was um, conducted community HIV testing in France. Um, and I'm also consulting uh, some of these uh, organizations to develop community-based research with them. I'm, I feel also very proud to be part of the new launch Lincoln International Institute for Rural Health at the University of Lincoln in the East Midlands of England. We are only one year uh, years old, but we already have been very successful in attracting uh, prestigious grants such as the Wolfram Foundation. And the, the aim of um, our institute is to, is to shed the light on the, the challenge uh, that rural community face and who remain underrepresented uh, by policymakers. And so our institute focus on four axes. Uh, the first focus uh, on the access to care among disadvantages population and those with chronic condition. The second one focus on studies uh, and interventions that could prevent or allow uh, early screening or of health condition. And the third one uh, aims to identify markers and models uh, that could be used to predict uh, disease spread, for example. And the final one aims to explore how the growing amount of available data could be used to improve uh, health uh, in rural areas. So back to the main topic uh, of my uh, presentation. My aim here is to describe how ethnic minority communities were affected during COVID-19. And I will first start by describing what we mean uh, by ethnic minority communities and also their origins. 
And the first part of my presentation will be then related to the psychosocial vulnerabilities that, that this community have experienced during the COVID-19 pandemic. As a second part of my presentation, I will go more into the detail uh, about why some ethnic minority groups are more at risk of SARS-CoV-2 infection. And I have to say that because of my re research uh, geographic area uh, and of the li limited, ta limited time of my presentation, the results uh, presented will focus mainly in the UK and the US. But it's also important to, to remember that very few uh, countries actually currently collect um, et ethnic diversity data. Thus, it's very difficult to have a global picture uh, of ethnic minorities in the rest of the world. So what, what, what we mean by ethnic minority? So according to the Cambridge Dictionary, an ethnic minority is a group of people of particular race or nationality living in a country or area where most people are from uh, a different race or nationality. So it's important to keep in mind that this ethnic group can be either native uh, of the country they are currently living, or in most cases, uh, in most cases, uh, they are born abroad. So, except in particular case uh, of native becoming a minority ethnic uh, after, for example, uh, ethnic cleansing or war, as it was the case for the Native American, ethnic minorities in a given country are mainly from either recent or old uh, migration. And worldwide, the number of migrant population is increasing, but yet remained at a constant uh, proportion of the world population. And the reason of, uh, reasons of migration have um, changed over the last centuries, but the overwhelming reason uh, most migrants leave uh, their home is related to either work, family, or study. And actually, when we look at the number, it's just less than 10% uh, of immigrants uh, that are refugees. So historically, and also currently, the US record a particularly high number of migrants, uh, as well as Europe. And some of these countries have a higher number of immigrants than their general population, such as, for example, Qatar, whose Qatar has 79% uh, of his, its current population that are new immigrants. And something also important to keep in mind is that Asian community constitute more than 40% of migrants abroad. So the important historical and recent migration have made the US a country with a large proportion of non-white residents with nearly 40% of the US population. Uh, which is defined as non-white. And perhaps uh, if you look a bit closer, um, someone will wonder where are classified the Hispanic and Latino group in the US figure. Well, most of them are grouped with the white. Uh, they represent roughly um, one third of the white category. Uh, they do not appear here because US statistics consider only race uh, and Hispanic and Latino are considered as ethnic groups. And in the UK, the minority ethnic groups take a smaller proportion uh, in the general population compared to US. They represent 21% of the general population, 50% if you only consider non-white ethnicities. And in the UK, the two main non-white ethnic groups are South Asian ethnicity, which uh, relate to Indian, Pakistani, and Bangladeshi. And in the other hand, black ethnicity, which includes uh, blacks from Africa and Caribbean. And so 
the idea to remember here is that despite uh, being considered as minorities, they actually represent a large fraction of both the US and the, the UK. So let's move on to the psychological social vulnerabilities that ethnic minorities, uh, minority communities have experienced during the COVID-19 pandemic. <laughs> so results from the UK shows that mental health distress at the early stage of the pandemic considerably increased, uh, increased uh, in the UK population. However, mental health distress was significantly more prevalent among non-white British communities. As you can see on the figure, South Asian uh, community, um, here called with the acronym BIP on the, um, on, on the figure, which relate to Bangladesh, Indian, and Pakistani. And you can see that this community were particularly affected because before the pandemic, they had the lowest uh, mental health distress prevalence, uh, but they got the highest uh, during the first peak of uh, the epidemic. On the other hand, US data shows high heterogeneity in terms of mental health distress, with higher distress among Hispanic and Latino, but lowest among Black communities. But where does that heterogeneity in mental health distress come from? Well, the first key element for this answer is the racial division of work. And I will show you that uh, with the next figure. So here are the proportion of ethnic group uh, within selecting occupation uh, in the UK. And as you can see here of the underlying in red, uh, you see that more than a quarter of healthcare professionals in the UK are from minority uh, groups and uh, black are particularly, black communities are particular, particularly overrepresented as they represent more than 15% uh, in that sector, uh, despite being, despite representing less than 4% uh, uh, of the UK population. And you can see also that uh, Black and South Asian communities are also found as well in non-health related uh, frontline jobs, such as taxi and bus driver, uh, but also security guards and wholesale and retail. But an important number and growing uh, number of studies have shown that frontline workers, both health or non-health related, are at an increasing risk for poor mental health outcomes. Sorry. For example, a study conducted among more than 20,000 healthcare workers shows that nearly half of healthcare workers are experiencing burnout symptoms. Another key element in the mental health distress faced by some ethnic minority groups is the inequalities they experience in employment, financial support, and housing. And some minorities, such as Black communities, already experience lower employment rates and financial precarity that have been exacerbating during the COVID-19 period. So, as you can see here, uh, the percentage of unemployed were higher for Black and uh, Latino communities before the COVID-19 pandemic. The increase of jobless Latino was quicker, you can see in the, the blue one. Um, so the increase of jobless Latino was quicker than the other two ethnic groups. However, you can, we can see that white groups were much likely to, to remain employed compared to the two uh, other ethnic groups. As you can see, the, the gap 
in June, it's much higher than the gap in employment in February. And I think this figure uh, well represents the impact of COVID-19 pandemic on exacerbating ex existing inequalities. And at last, but not least, factors that some uh, ethnic minority groups have experienced during uh, COVID-19 is the higher social discrimination. Indeed, we, we can't forget to, to mention um, the social exclusion and violence that many um, ethnic groups have experienced in, in both uh, the UK and US during the COVID-19 period. And this experience led to uh, several street protests like the one uh, pictured uh, following George Floyd's murder uh, on May 26, 2020. Um, and so, these street protests, did, they, they didn't come from nowhere. Uh, as we have already seen, uh, the pandemic has increasing the existing economic inequalities, uh, disadvantaging certain ethnic groups. But some of these groups were also experiencing high rates of stigmatization. Oh, sorry. So, in the US, so here you've got the figure uh, about hate crime. And so you can see that in US, hate crime has risen up to 25% in 2020. Black and Asian community experience the higher rate uh, of hate crime. What's interesting here is that hate crime did not progress in the same way depending on the ethnic group. Asian populations who tend to be less targeted for hate crime uh, have recorded a sharp increase in reported crime, plus 70%. And my opinion is that uh, this hate has been rightly fueled uh, by the incredibly stigmatizing, stigmatizing communication uh, of the former US government, who used some inappropriate uh, terms such as China or one virus that targeted uh, Asian population as directly responsive for the COVID-19 pandemic. In the UK, the situation has not been much better for ethnic minorities either uh, because hate crime is also continuously increasing since uh, 2012 and it has doubled during the, the past five years. And on the right uh, figures, you can see that the, the number of crime for 1,000 per person. And you can see that just, uh, so it's a figure in the city that have been done in the city of, of London. And you can see that hate crime against uh, Chinese natives has been multiplied by six. And other communities uh, that I didn't show here, but like the mus Muslim community, have also experienced a 50% increase uh, in hate crime uh, as well. So we have just seen that many minority ethnic uh, communities have experienced higher uh, mental health and social distress uh, during the COVID-19 period. And so, in this second part, we are going to see that they are also at increasing risk of SARS-CoV-2 infection. As the number of COVID-19 related deaths is increasing, we tend to forget that behind this, these numbers, there are, there are lives and, and families. And this picture is a random selection of the, uh, of the first medical staff to die following a COVID-19 infection uh, in the UK. And this is somewhat striking when you consider that the majority of people in that picture are from ethnic minority communities. On that picture, two thirds belong to ethnic minority groups, despite again, only representing 20% of medical staff in UK. 
that higher mortality following SARS-CoV-2 infection among South Asian and Black communities in the UK have been confirmed in a large cohort study of 17 million adults in the UK. And that study show that these two communities are more, uh, are more likely to test positive for COVID-19, despite having similar uh, testing rates than other communities. And so that particular result, um, it indicates um, that th th there is a higher exposure to SARS-CoV-2 infection uh, among these communities. But where does this higher exposure uh, to SARS-CoV-2 infection come from? Well, the first reason is the professional occupation of both South Asian and Black communities. We saw before that South Asian and Black communities were more likely uh, to do front-line job, uh, especially taxi drivers, security guards, and healthcare workers. But when we look at the age stand standardized death rate, we can see that uh, these jobs are those with the highest COVID-19 mortality rates, um, which can be explained by a higher exposure to SARS-CoV-2 infection. In the early stage of the pandemic, access to personal protective equipment, such as face masks, were uh, also particularly insufficient. And studies have um, showed that medical staff from non-white ethnicity were uh, also more likely to report poor training, but also poor access um, to personal protective equipment uh, in UK. And communication also around personal protective equipment was also quite chaotic in some country, like, for example, in, in my home country in France, because at the early stage of the pandemic, our French government spokesperson states that face masks are ineffective to protect against uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection, which is everything but wrong. Um, and a way to deflect, uh, it was a way to deflect public anger about a shortage of uh, fast makes that we were experiencing in our country. Uh, but unfortunately for it, it didn't work very well. And however, compliance uh, with protective behavior is generally found higher among non-white ethnic groups. And that, that was proved in a study uh, co conducted by Breckwell and colleagues um, in the Journal of Health Psychology. And what they also found is that the protective uh, behavior compliance, it's not related to ethnicity, but it's more related to trust in the scientific communities and also access to uh, information. Ethnic minorities also tend to live in major uh, urban areas, uh, which with high human density, uh, that increase their chance to be uh, in contact with someone infected. And the fact that um, this community also tend to be economically deprived uh, means that they also, um, they also rely more on heavily on public transport that again can increase their odd of being in contact with someone uh, infected. And if many chronic conditions have been linked uh, with worse COVID-19 progression outcomes, few research actually have been undertaken to understand the effect of some underlying health condition. And to date, only kidney, uh, chronic kidney disease and obesity seems to increase the, the risk of SARS-CoV-2 infection. Chronic kidney disease is also shown to be more prevalent uh, in Black and Asian communities uh, in UK. Some early studies uh, suggest that genetic factor could explain the 
uh, vulnerability of some group, uh, but we need to be very cautious uh, because um, this research, this research, uh, research on this subject remains uh, really scarce. And knowing the number of SARS-CoV-2 infection linked to genetics is uh, currently unknown. However, some question remains uh, regarding SARS-CoV-2 exposure among uh, minority ethnic groups. And many of the available studies were conducted during the first wave of the pandemic before July, uh, sorry, 2020. And so understanding the evolution of SARS-CoV-2 infection risk uh, factor across the different wave of the pandemic is uh, important because we need to observe if the general, general, generalization and adoption of mitigation measure, such as provision of personal protective equipment or vaccination rollout, have reduced uh, socio-demographic and economic risk uh, inequalities. Also, SARS-CoV-2 infection risk in rural regions uh, with limited, uh, with, with few uh, ethnic uh, diversity remains poorly described uh, in, in the UK. And finally, we aim to see if the higher SARS-CoV-2 exposure among some uh, ethnic uh, groups could be explained uh, mainly by socioeconomic living environment and occupational factor alone, uh, or if there is some other factors that should need to be considered um, to explaining this uh, higher vulnerabilities for SARS-CoV-2 infection. So, with us conducted um, a court study uh, with my research team um, from the start of the pandemic for one year, uh, among more than 13,000 healthcare staff uh, working in uh, 119 facilities in Lincolnshire, uh, which is a very rural region uh, in the United Kingdom. And in Lincolnshire, uh, an important point is that ethnic minorities are underrepresented in both the general population and the medical staff compared to national figures. And so we followed clinical and non-clinical staff for one year from the 1st of February 2020 to the 10th of February 2021. So that figure, uh, it shows you the number of people with SARS-CoV-2 positive tests by month. So you can see that our first wave was around April 2020. Uh, then because of the lockdown, it's decreasing. It was decreasing. And uh, later, uh, around November and uh, later uh, December, uh, we get our second wave. Um, and uh, all black rectangles represent the facilities and the color uh, is the number of staff uh, in that facility. So you can see that most of the new infection were mainly occurring uh, in larger uh, facilities. And so regarding uh, incidents per person years, so it was 5% during the first COVID-19 wave uh, before August and 17%, so three times higher during the second wave uh, after uh, September 2020. So here are the Kaplan-Meier uh, survival curve by uh, ethnic groups. So the higher the curve is and the higher the, your uh, risk, um, your, probab your probability of SARS-CoV-2 in infection uh, is increasing. And so you got uh, the black blue, uh, the black uh, healthcare staff and the dark green here, uh, Southern Asian uh, staff. And so, you can see that after six months of follow-up, uh, so around 180 here at the middle, 
the higher risk was already present among uh, both black and Sustan Asian staff. Uh, so again, the dark blue and the dark green respectively. And the, di the, the difference is even greater, uh, especially among the black uh, healthcare staff after one year uh, of follow-up, as you can see. So here there is a lot of number, but I will go it slowly. Um, so here we aim to investigate uh, the risk for SARS-CoV-2 infection among Black and Sous uh, Asian, as we see, but now we wanted to, so we already see that there is a higher um, uh, incident among these two communities, but how our aim was uh, to adjust that risk of uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection after adjusting on uh, other variables uh, like those that I've presented um, previously. Uh, and that could explain uh, this higher risk among them. So the variable include uh, in that model, which is a Cox multivariate model, where so the demographics, so age uh, and sex, but we also take into account uh, the characteristic of the living place, such as uh, urban rural classification, and also the index of multiple deprivation, which is composed uh, of different dimensions uh, of deprivation, such as uh, employment rates, um, access to public transport, and also access to um, uh, healthcare services in the residential sector. And in addition, we include occupational factors such as the staff group, if you belong to a clinical or non-clinical uh, staff, if you belong to estates uh, for the non-clinical, for example, or if you belong to a physician or nurse uh, in the clinical group. Um, but also we uh, adjust on the exposure at work, like the time you spend at work. Uh, and we also take into account the number of living absence uh, for infection precaution, for example, and uh, as well as other leave uh, for uh, absence. Um, and we also take into account clinical factors, uh, such as the number of non-COVID uh, related diseases. And finally, uh, to take into account the cluster formation pattern of the SARS-CoV-2 spread, we had a cluster effect uh, by facility. And what we can read from this uh, figure is that both uh, during the first wave, so the line in blue, and the second wave, so lines in red, Black and South Asian staff uh, were still uh, at higher risk of SARS-CoV-2 infection, even after adjusting all, on all the variables that I've presented. And so what we see is that Black staff were overall two times more likely to be infected, and South Asian staff had 66% higher risk of being infected uh, compared to their white counterparts uh, when adjusting on other covariable. And no higher risk were found for the other uh, ethnic groups. And another interesting information is that we, we observed that staff, uh, regardless of their, um, again, because we are just as regardless of their uh, staff group, we were also observing that staff from the lowest pay grade uh, were three times more likely to get infected compared to those with the highest salary. And so irrespective, again, of the staff group and other uh, covariable. So, what we can conclude from our result is that Black and South Asian healthcare staff, despite being underrepresented in our area uh, compared to the rest of the UK, were still overrepresented uh, in the number of SARS CoV 2 infection. Whereas the uh, higher mortality have been already known at the beginning of the first wave, 
um, no, sorry, the higher risk of SARS-CoV-2 infection was already known at the beginning of the first wave. Their persistent higher risk during the second wave suggests that intervention aimed at protecting them were either absent or failed uh, in reducing their op occupational risks. And how our results highlight uh, unacceptable inequalities in a sector where everyone belonging to the same staff group should benefit from the same level of protective measure. And how our results has also showed persins, uh, persistent infection risk among uh, Black and South Asian community. And even so, after adjusting on demographic, economic situation, occupational exposure, clinical factor, and home uh, environment, uh, which may suggest that potential other viable that perhaps may explain the susceptibilities uh, to this population. So now we have seen that ethnic uh, minority communities were more psychologically and socially affected, but also more exposed uh, to the COVID-19 pandemic. So where do we go from here? Um, personally, I think uh, an important action would be to increase the visibility of these communities uh, in national statistics and survey. Uh, I state, uh, as I stated uh, earlier, uh, many countries do not collect do, do not collect data on uh, ethnicity, uh, like such my, my home country, France, or also Australia. And I mean, if you don't observe uh, and collect data on this community, you cannot understand uh, what happened to them. And considering the all the social and psychological distress uh, they have faced but also the distress uh, they experience or they will experience having, having the heaviest uh, death tool. We need intervention to detect uh, psychiatric symptoms and also post-traumatic stress uh, in a timely manner, and which will need the ease of financial and geographical barrier uh, to access mental health services. And a suggestion is that mental health care um, delivered via telemedicine uh, through phone um, or video conferencing is a promising intervention uh, as it has been implemented successfully in, in, in many contexts. And I believe there is also a presentation about that uh, th this afternoon. Um, but that aspect also question digital literacy, but also digital access uh, of these communities. We also need to urgently increase the COVID-19 vaccine uptake among this community group, because for, um, and for what, and for that, um, we need to build um, better trust and better communication with these communities uh, to remove vaccine hesitancy, which is much higher among this group, as well as removing uh, remaining access barrier. If not, we know that the existing COVID-19 death inequality will uh, increase. And I believe personally that it's a national and global duty to protect ethnic minority communities who contribute and also give their share uh, in key uh, and economic sector uh, in our countries. I will end my presentation uh, uh, with this map showing the current uh, vaccination coverage world war. And as we just discussed that ethnic minorities group are less likely to be vaccinated in the UK and in the US but if vaccine coverage inequalities exist uh, at a national scale in these two countries, these inequalities are more appalling at an international scale. And as some Western countries are currently uh, doing a third dose rollout, uh, we need also to keep in mind that vaccination is efficient if everyone access it and we will not win without a global uh, and equitable uh, vaccination strategy. 
And well, th this is now the end of my presentation. Uh, I'm doing. I'm going to take the, that opportunity to uh, thanks uh, my team who work with me in conducting the study among the healthcare stack in UK, and also two special thanks to to my colleague uh, Dr. Ross Kane and Dr. David Nelson uh, for that, their valuable contribution in preparing um, this presentation. Thank you very much for for your attention.